Let me ask you a question. What do Buddhists and atheists and Christians, evangelicals, Catholics, Mormons, and anybody else you can think of, what do they all agree on? What do they all have in common? Can you think of anything? Can you think of anything that Baptists and Presbyterians and Catholics and Hindus and Muslims and scientists and atheists and secularists, what is one thing they all agree on? Well, here's one thing, and I think this is true, and that they all agree on the value of gratitude. Here's one article I, I read this week, 35, 35 scientific benefits of gratitude, mental health and research findings. Let me summarize a few of those. It'll improve your sleep. It'll lower your high blood pressure. It'll prevent you from overeating. Gratitude motivates you to exercise more. It will help your immune system, which means you'll be healthier in every disease you possibly could get. You probably will be less likely to get. It improves pain tolerance. It helps keep glucose levels under control. It extends your lifespan. You might actually live longer. It helps patients with heart illness. And the article goes on to talk about spiritual and health benefits. It increases self-confidence, patience, resilience, reduces envy and jealousy. It makes you more opti optimistic, less materialistic, more forgiving. It helps you in the battle against depression. It helps you in recovery from addiction. It enhances your vitality. It enhances your spiritualism, whatever that is. Some of the emotional benefits, it improves your mood. It helps you deal with grief. It helps you deal with memories. It contributes to your happiness. Some of the social benefits, it helps you in your romantic relationships. It helps you in your friendship relationships. It helps you deal with your family you sometimes struggle to get along with. It helps foster a healthy social circle. Everything that you can imagine, everything that you can imagine is better if you will develop the habit, the automatic thought of gratitude. In pop psychology, they sometimes talk about ants, A-N-T-S, automatic negative thoughts. And we want to replace ants, we want to replace automatic negative thoughts with automatic grateful thoughts. That's where we're heading today. The interesting thing about this article is there are page after page after page after page of documentation. In other words, gratitude is one of those things. Gratitude is one of those things that has been more carefully researched. It's been talked about longer by more religions, including Christianity and, and many others, and has been carefully documented by double-blind, placebo-based tests that demonstrate that gratitude will make your life better in every way imaginable. One of the best books I've read on this, I read one nearly every year, but this one, uh, thank you, pal, read or reread. I've read this before and listened to it again this, this year. Deborah Norville says, the benefits of gratitude read like claims of some too good to be true infomercial. They will make you more optimistic. They will lead you to exercise more. They'll think you, lead you to think more creatively. You'll bounce back from adversity faster. You'll be less intimidated by challenge. You'll have a higher immune response. You'll be alert and interested. You'll be more adventurous. adventurous. You will actually live longer. You'll be more likely to help others. You'll be more likable. You'll be more tolerant. You'll be a better boss or team leader, and you just might do better on a test. Everything, every positive outcome that we want is demonstrated by double-blind, placebo-based tests that demonstrates that gratitude will make your life better. So what can we learn about gratitude from Psalm 65? Praise awaits you, our God in Zion. What does that word Zion mean, by the way? It can actually mean a number of things. Could be that hill that, that, that Jerusalem is built around, or could, could be Jerusalem, or could be heaven, or it could be the peace, people of Israel. It has quite a number of uh, definitions, actually. Anyway, praise awaits you, our God in Zion. In this case, seems to appear to me in heaven. Our God in Zion, where God is. To you, our vows will be fulfilled. You who answer prayer, what do we learn about gratitude from right there? You who answer prayer, to you all people will come. When we were overwhelmed by sins, you forgave our transgressions. What do we learn about gratitude right there? Blessed are those you choose to bring near. What do we learn about gratitude? To live in your courts. You are filled with good things of your house, of your holy temple. You answer us with awesome and righteous deeds. God, our Savior, the hope of all the ends of the earth 
and the farthest seas, who formed the mountains. What do we learn about gratitude? Who formed the mountains by your power, having armed yourself with strength, who stilled the roaring of the seas, the roaring of the waves, and the turmoil of the nations. The whole earth is filled with awe at your wonders. Where morning dawns, where evening fades, you call forth songs of joy. It's not today's topic, but one of the consistent themes of Scripture is this idea of joy. And I would say that one of the most important and one of the most difficult commands in all the Bible is to rejoice in the Lord always. And that's alluded to in this verse here. You care for the land. You water it. You enrich it abundantly. The streams of God are filled with water to provide the people with grain so that you have ordained it. You drench its furrows and level its ridges. You soften it with showers and bless it with crops. You crown the year with your bounty and your carts overflow with abundance. The grasslands of the wilderness overflow. The hills are clothed with gladness. The meadows are covered with flocks. The valleys are mantled with grain. They shout for joy and they sing. What do we learn about gratitude from this passage? Well, I see four things that we are to be grateful for. And the first one is answered prayer. In verse two, he says, you answer prayer to all who, the people who will come. It's a consistent teaching of scripture. Jeremiah 33, three says, call to me and I will answer you and I will tell you great and unsearchable things that you do not know. Jesus said, ask and it'll be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. The first thing that we are to be grateful for is answered prayer. The second thing is forgiven sin. Scripture says, when we were overwhelmed by our sins, you forgave our transgressions. And the question is, what would you pay for that? I want you to imagine that you could not find the forgiveness of your sins. What would you pay for that? And if you're thinking rightly, you would pay almost anything for that. And it is given to us as a free gift based on the Jesus death on the cross and based on our faith in his gift. First John 1 John 1.9 says, do you, do you know what First John 1 John 1.9 says? Let me give you a little bit of a hint. If we confess, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and he is just and he will, he will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. And I ask you again, what would you pay for that? Whoever conceals their sin does not prof, prosper. Whoever imagines that they are not sinners does not prosper. But the one who confesses, the one who admits, the one who freely says, I am a sinner, the one who confesses and renounces their sin finds mercy. Praise the Lord, my soul. Forget not all of his benefits, many, many benefits in following God. The first one lifted here, listed here, who forgives all your sins and heals all your diseases. We're thankful for answered prayer. We're for thankful for the forgiveness of sins. And we're thankful, thirdly, for the nearness of God. Blessed are those you choose to bring near to live in your courts. We are filled with good things of your house, of your holy temple. Psalm 145, 18, the Lord is near to all who call on him, to all who call on him in truth. You are near, Lord, and all your commands are true. How do we get that nearness? The Lord is close to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. Enter his gates with thanksgiving. Get into the proximity of God through thanksgiving, but get into nearness with God. Get into intimacy with God with praise and into his courts, into nearness, into intimacy with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. And then a fourth thing he says, thank God for creation. The whole earth is filled with awe at your wonders. Where morning dawns, where evening fades, you call forth songs of joy. Scripture says the heavens declare, the heavens shout, the glory of God, the skies proclaim the work of his hands. Since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and his divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made so that people are without excuse. So the application, what is the application of today's passage? We want to be grateful. We want to be grateful for answered prayer. We want to be grateful for forgiven, forgiven sin. We want to be grateful for the nearness that we have in God. And we want to be grateful for his majesty in creation. So the application, ready? The application, try really hard. Try really hard this year, this Thanksgiving, this Thanksgiving. Remind yourself to feel a little bit guilty about not being very grateful and try really hard to be grateful. Is that the application?
Well, in fact, that is part of the application. I bring to you this list again and again to try to drill it into your mind that discipleship is a little bit complicated. It is a little bit complicated in following God. And one of the aspects of discipleship is the law of effort, the law of trying really hard, the law of make every effort. If you don't believe it, I don't have the list in my in my PowerPoints this week, but do a little word study on that phrase, make every effort, and you'll hear it, see it appear over and over and over again. But it is not all just about making every effort. And I want to talk to you about how, how you can make gratitude, how you can make gratitude your automatic, not negative thoughts, but your automatic grateful thoughts. I want to talk to you about how to make gratitude not just easy, but how to make gratitude automatic. There are four steps to making gratitude a habit. The first one is activity. Activity, meaning we're not just longing for the general attitude of gratitude. You hear that phrase a lot. We need to develop the attitude of gratitude. We do need to develop the attitude of gratitude, but we develop the attitude of gratitude by developing the activity of gratitude. I have had two that I have used for years and years and years. And you even hear me teaching over the years for many years. You've heard me talk about these before. And I want to remind you that effective teaching Effective teaching is the effective use of review. I've had two activities that have helped me to develop the habit of, act of gratitude. Do you remember what those are? The first one is this. When I go to bed at night, often, not every night, but often, I think of 20 things, five things on this hand, five things on this hand, five things on this foot. My five toes remind me of that. And the five toes on this foot remind me of that. First, five you remember? Memories are created in that moment where you think, what is it? What is it? What is it? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Anyway, I think you ought to say this to your people over and over and over again. Year after year, you model it, you develop the habit yourself, and then you teach your people these things over and over again. Five family members. I've got six grandkids, so that's fairly easy for me. I can think of five of those six. I might think of all six of those grandkids or my kids or people like my sisters and my brother and so on. So on. But anyway, I think of five thing, family members and I think, thank you, God, for my little grandchildren. And then I think of five other people that I'm grateful for. These might be church members, members of my small group, other friends that I've known o o over the years, five family members, five other people. Then this foot reminds me that I think of five physical things. I've got a television. I've got a computer. I've got a smartphone. I've got air conditioning. I've got running water in my house. I think, thank you, Lord, for five things. And then I think of five spiritual things. Things. I've got the Bible. I've got the Holy Spirit. I've got the forgiveness of sins. I've got the opportunity for nearness to God. I've got answered prayer. I think of five spiritual things. So here is an activity. And then what is the trigger? The trigger is what triggers me to engage in that activity. So this particular activity, the trigger is my pillow. So when I lay my head on my pillow at night, I think of five family members, five other people, five physical things, five spiritual things. And then when I get up in the morning, I've got another trigger. It used to be my my trigger was a little green rug in front of, in front of my sink. And, and I wa would walk across that tile floor and I would think about how grateful I am for that little green rug. Well, then a few years back, I got some house slippers and I've actually put those house slippers on. So I put my feet in those house slippers and the trigger, the trigger now is those slippers. And I think, thank you, God, for this first, first thing in the morning, first thing when I stand up anyway, I'm thinking, thank God for these little slippers. Thank God that I've got a restroom. Thank God that I've got a bed to uh, sleep in. And I end my day thanking God for 20 things and I begin my day that act of putting my feet in those little brown slippers reminds me, reminds me to thank God for things. So I have an activity, not just the vague, warm feeling of gratitude, that's going to come, but the activity, doing something, writing a letter, making a list, doing something that engages us in the activity of gratitude. And then I've got a trigger, a trigger that's going to remind me to do that activity. The third component is time time, meaning it's not going to make any difference in your life that you do this today or tomorrow or next week, or maybe even for a week or two. But if you do this over time, it'll take about three months to form a firm habit, the firm habit of gratitude. And if you do that for three months and you keep that up for a few years, your life will be unrecognizable. We need a activity. We need a trigger. We need time. And that develops into the habit, the habit of gratitude. And here's the good news. 
If you can develop this habit, you can develop any habit. If you can develop the habit of gratitude, you can develop any habit through the same method. And if you do so, your life will be unrecognizably better as a result. And may God richly bless you as you teach these truths to your people this week.